You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. Call me Ishmael, Will. (laughs) And hello, listeners. Welcome to the third episode of 2020 Spooky. Spookulative Evolution, back again. With Leviathans. Oh boy, that's right. This year's topic is sea monsters. Yeah. And we just keep getting bigger. Yes. Well, that's not true. The Kraken's pretty big. Yeah, the Kraken (laughs) was bigger than I thought it was going to be when I started taking those notes. (laughs) We are doing the Leviathan this episode. So every episode of Spooky, the goal is to take the rules of evolution and natural selection, the real world processes of evolving an animal and apply it to monsters, mythical creatures, creatures from stories, whatever has come up for that theme. Something you could reasonably apply the term monster to in honor of the month of October Yep, and everyone's favorite holiday. And this year we've been doing sea monsters and today we will be looking at the Leviathan, which is... A weirder one than the ones we've done up to now, just because it's a a very different category. So, every episode we do a little dive into the history of the creature before we do our speculative evolution, so that we have some material to work with. Right, What is what are we trying to achieve? Yes. Because this particular style of speculative evolution, we are selecting an end goal, yep. which differentiates it. From normal evolution. Yes, exactly. We have an end goal in mind, and we're saying, how can we get there? We're trying to explain the history and the reasons for why it looks like what all the stories have told us it looks like. Exactly. So we we lay out our baseline. What what do we need to evolve with our biological made-up stuff? Absolutely. And the Leviathan is a little different than the the previous monsters we've done this year, because we've already done the Kraken. Yep. And we did our bevy of sea serpents. Sure did. And both of those were very famous for being quote unquote sighted monsters. That they were brought back as tales from uh, sailors at sea. Right. They had a very a, a cryptid feel mm-hmm. that it wasn't necessarily like, okay, here's a, a movie monster or here's this mythological creature. Yeah, here's this monster that Hercules fought. Exactly. This These in some cases, are things that people claimed to have witnessed. Yeah. Now, you know, and sea serpents had a little bit of that mythological origin that there are great ocean serpents in our historical and mythological and religious tales. The Leviathan falls into that category almost exclusively, which is kind of what makes it different, that the Leviathan is a religious beast. It is a creature from the stories of mainly Judaism and Hebrew books and Christianity, which is different just because usually our monsters have like a whole bunch of sources from all over the place and that are, these actually are fairly consistent in where the, the stories of the Leviathan are coming from, but there is some variety and randomness in this creature. This creature also has the distinction of, I think, being the third creature we've done a spooky about that is not a type of creature, but is the one. Yes, is the The, Leviathan. Like the Kraken. Yes. The the Leviathan. And so, yeah, most of the monsters we do are one of many or at least like a category. This one is capital T, the capital L, (laughs) Leviathan. (laughs) Now... Leviathan, the word Leviathan, comes from the old Hebrew Leviathan, which means twister or coiled. Okay. Because in a lot of the old stories, the Leviathan did take a very sea serpent form. Right. I've seen a a number of versions of it that Mm -hmm. are basically a big sea serpent. Yes. Which you may be saying, yeah, but you just did sea serpents. That's true. There are other forms of the Leviathan, yes. so we have things to work with. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we won't just rehash the yes, serpent. Exactly. Don't listen to the last episode. We <laughs> save ourselves a lot of time. It has taken many forms, and the word has kind of translated to different things. So, twister coiled is the more original Old Hebrew meaning. In the Old Testament, it was taken in the more Greek meaning, which was a dragon. Okay. In that it was a 
serpent in the sense of a dragon, which typically in the Old Testament and in those uh, adjoining tales meant Satan. Like dragons were synonymous with the devil. Right, right. Or a devil at least. And in the modern Hebrew, it actually is kind of uh, uh, literalized into whale. Mm -hmm, I've heard that. Yeah, like Leviathan nowadays means much more whale or translates much more to whale than serpent or anything. Gotcha. So this is a creature of religious story, Jewish and Christian tales, and has a couple of like themes that go along with it. It's never a important part of the stories. Hmm. Like it's never like feet. It's not like the Hydra was where it's like here in this chapter of Hercules's great trials, the Hydra, right? It was the raid boss. Yeah, exactly. The Leviathan is mentioned a number of times and <laughs> a side character. Yeah. It, it's mentioned that it is there. It's sometimes described, but it's not doing things. Typically there are a couple of, exceptions of that but for the most part it's not like a player in the stories or it's like part of the environment yes it is often in association with a couple of other great beasts so the leviathan is known as a great beast of the ocean the beast of the ocean and it is often in association with the behemoth the mm -hmm. beast of the land and ziz z-i-z the beast of the air right and that they are like the great beasts I, I have heard uh, the argument that this is was the basis for the legendary Pokemon from Ruby and Sapphire. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza, the, the beasts of the land, sea, and the air. Exactly. And so that's kind of what is supposed to be represented with these creatures. Though there are many people who have come out to say that they think that it's much more a metaphor for the ocean itself. Gotcha. And that the Leviathan represents the violence and, and monstrous aspects of the sea. Right. Which would go along with the environmental mm -hmm. kind of air of it. It's like, well, you don't actually, you don't go fight the ocean. Yeah, exactly. It's it's something you have to be aware of and overcome uh, the dangers of. Now, it's mentioned in a, a number of religious texts. The Hebrew Bible, the Book of Job, throughout Judaism, and various texts. Uh, there's a number of descriptions of it by ancient rabbis describing it or describing, you know, stories of ancient rabbis encountering it. And then it does show up in the Bible, the, the Christian the Bible, Christian, yeah. a number of times. And the descriptions vary. There are a number of things that are mentioned here and there that are kind of mentioned once and then not mentioned again. A couple of the main themes is that the Leviathan was created by God, you know, the, the, the one God in these religions. And in Judaism, it's even specified it was created on the fifth day of oh, creating. Is that the Sea Creatures Day? I don't know. I have no clue. Uh, we are not biblical no, scholars. That is something I was. <laughs> that is something I was going to say. Is taking notes for this was probably the most out of depth I felt <laughs> taking notes for stuff on the podcast because it was like, and in this book of the Bibles, I don't. That do, tells me very little. I'm yeah. sorry. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> um, in in at least in Judaism. God originally created two Leviathans, male and female, and for fear that they would multiply and, like, destroy the earth, slew the female. Hmm. So the remaining the Leviathan is the male right. of it's, the mating pair. It's a foundling and an endling. Yes, exactly. And in some versions, it's he then, God then, kept the females, the, the flesh of the female, the, the body, or that eventually the surviving male will be served up as a meal at the end of days. Huh. So the Leviathan, and that's really kind of the core of the Leviathan, is that God created one or two. If it created two, slew one of them. And either that dead one is being saved to be served to the righteous or those who, you know, are saved or various versions of those who survive the end of days, the second coming and all of, all of that stuff, and that the Leviathan will be part of that final meal or first meal of the yeah, end the, of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. And in some versions, it's that the Leviathan will be slain. The surviving Leviathan will be hunted down and slain for that meal. And that's the core of the stories. 
huh, that makes me wonder, uh, sort of idly and without deep knowledge of uh, religious text, if that means the Leviathan is kosher. That I did find a mention of that. Interesting. Yes. Does it have scales? So they said it was described, at least in one thing, as having mighty fins, mm-hmm. which some scholars have taken to mean that it is therefore kosher fish. Mm-hmm. Part, and part of the reason this was a discussion is because there are some descriptions of the Leviathan that group it with just other animals. Right. Uh, there's one description in the book of Job that lists it with like goats and eagles and just other, mun- as they put it, mundane animals. Right. So which the, the bestiary yeah. of the world. And it led some scholars to take that the Leviathan was not a one-of-a-kind holy creature, but was a description of some animal. Right. So they started debating on what the animal, the, the real-world animal was that is the Leviathan. And a couple of popular ones were thrown around. Uh, for a while... The Nile crocodile was a very popular oh, yeah, I've heard that. description for the Leviathan because it was aquatic, scaly, and a lot of times the Leviathan is described breathing fire. Okay. And crocodiles have often been connected with dragon t- stories. Yeah. So some people pointed to crocodiles. Other people suggest that it was whales. Yeah. I've heard that too. But the description of mighty fins made them think it was a fish. And therefore kosher, which therefore also lines up with the final meal at the end of days, since that is in the Judaism version of the tales as well. That's fascinating. Right? I like that I had that question and there was an answer. Yes. Because now that I think about it, of course there was an answer to it. I made sure, when I saw that, I was like, well, that's going in the notes because that's fascinating. Because that's the kind of thing that Jewish scriptural analysts do. Yes. And analysts is, yeah, no, uh, analyzing the rules and kosher mm-hmm. rules. There has been tons of debate and discussion. So it doesn't surprise me at all that there has been discussion of, is this creature kosher if we're supposed to eat it? Exactly. Uh, which is interesting because from my memory of the kosher rules, reptiles, I believe, are universally not considered kosher. Which is why they were, uh, many people have written crocodile off yeah. the potentials to be the Leviathan. Uh, and I, I can't imagine whales are kosher. Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't think so. Because with mammals, there's very specific features they're supposed to have. And so that's actually been one of the interesting things with the Leviathan is it is never really described in like intimate detail. And when there are descriptions, it's vague and weird. There's Mm -hmm. also ancient art like, you know, from the Middle Ages and it disagrees on what it looks like. There's descriptions of it with horns. Uh, you know, having mighty teeth. One described it having horns upon which was written, I am one of the meanest creatures that inhabit the sea. I am 300 miles in length and enter this day into the jaws of Leviathan. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Yep. <laughs> so. So it can write. Yeah, you're right. So, or at least <laughs> it has a good tattooist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. There's also, there are descriptions of it being a serpent, but once again, the term serpent in religious connotations has a different connotation than just snake. Right. Like you said, often serpent can refer to reptiles in general, dragons, and the devil. The devil. Like that very often, that's why dragons were given serpentine features a lot of the time is because the righteous knight was going to slay the devilish dragon. Mm -hmm. So the description of it being serpentine, I don't know how much of that's metaphorical or, you know, supposed to be that it's actually a sea serpent, but there are ancient drawings of it as just a huge fish, like definitely scaled ray finned fish. Others have just called it a great beast. There was one description that said the Leviathan or, or one tail, I think maybe, uh, one telling that said the Leviathan is f- afraid of a small worm called a kilbit, and that these are worms that cling to the gills of large fish and kills them. Hmm. So that one at least claims that they, it is a gilled animal. Interesting. Susceptible to ectoparasites. To, to parasites, yep. <laughs> so lots of variety on what the Leviathan looks like and is shaped like. Like I said, some of them describe it as breathing fire. There was one that didn't say breathing fire, but said... When it's hungry, it sends forth from its mouth a heat so great it will make all the waters of the deep boil. Wow. 
So it's got a radiator mouth. Yeah, it's Godzilla. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's just heating up that radiation breath. There was even one description that described it emitting light from its body. Ooh. A brilliant light from its eyes particularly, but also from other parts of its body. And so like it and now a lot of these stories are coming from from what I could tell individual either interpretations or tales from rabbis uh like the, if there was a list of stories with different rabbis credited for these descriptions and yeah one of them described it as glowing in some way interesting yeah and there's disagreement on whether or not the leviathan is a good or bad beast some descriptions or some interpretations i guess is more accurate take it much more as a symbol of god's power Mm -hmm. that God created such an amazing beast, and now that beast is here. Others see the Leviathan as a sea demon, like in league with Satan. And there's very, it seems to be that there's various interpretations. Others see it as just like a sea monster, that it, you could bump into it while traveling the seas, and it's just like all the other sea monster stories that, you know, it might just get angry and sink your boat, your ship. So whether or not it's benevolent or evil or just a big monster to be creature is also fairly debated uh, or inconsistent at least interesting and then and over time the leviathan has kind of come to mean different things you know we talked already about the name has been translated differently over the ages but also there are other stories that have kind of shifted the perception of the leviathan it is associated with jonah but okay Swallowed by a whale, Jonah. Yep, but I, from what I could find, it is not what was supposed to have swallowed him. Got it. It's not supposed to have been the whale, but there are stories that I found. I didn't read them all because they were, it was actually like a lengthy backstory. <laughs> uh, but there are stories that have to do with Jonah interacting with the Leviathan. But I think the Leviathan has gotten connected with the whale who swallowed him. And then after Moby Dick, the original novel was written... The Leviathan started becoming much more heavily associated with whales, specifically sperm whales. Right. Because they use the term Leviathan in Moby Dick, I know, because when I thought about making yep. a Ishmael joke at the beginning of this episode, I went and uh, Googled it just to make sure. I was like, I bet they call it a Leviathan, and they do. Yes. And so <laughs> after that book, the Leviathan started becoming much more commonly used to describe whales and just great sea creatures. Right. That Le Leviathan was a description for something huge. And monstrous and often associated with the sea. Right. And I was going to mention that when we were talking about language and, and how, what it means in common usage, right? Leviathan has come to, to be a word just in the general mm -hmm. lexicon and it means something big. Yes. Uh, a leviathan it will be colorfully used as language to describe something big. In fact, a uh, fun fact leviathan i believe at one point was proposed as a genus name for mastodon oh yeah. I, if i remember correctly and it got dropped because mastodon that g already had a genus name yeah uh mastodon was also proposed which is why we know the word mastodon but it's all mammut yeah but no leviathan was also recommended for the mastodon because uh, it's big yeah right that that like mammoth that is a word that means big big mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the, the leviathan has has an interesting background for us to work from because it has a definite origin like as far as i could tell there weren't any indications of like there were stories of the leviathan and then these religious books were written this was a creature that came about via these books or the these stories and then has traveled through the relation of these religions Mm -hmm. and then was adopted into more popular culture to mean big sea monster. So it's it's kind of, we've got a, a, a an interesting grab bag because there's a, a solid origin, but the origin itself does not describe it a lot, and it gets most of its modern characters from just how we use it more generally. Yeah. Well, that's a fun, like you said, a grab bag yeah. of traits to go by. So our task then today is to speculatively evolve something that fits this sort of general 
almost partially metaphorical description of a creature. Well, that's the really the consistent things are that it is mighty. You know, it is like the sea monster to to beat all sea monsters. Right. So like right. it it is massively impressive. It is powerful. Like the stories describe it as being you know uh, indomitable in some of them a representation of god's power right or Earth. even uh, and and possibly an allegory for the ocean itself exactly so powerful and depending on which ones multi-featured right you know? so it it was typically described with at least some monstrous traits but those monstrous traits seem to completely change depending on which stories you pull from right right so let's lay down some groundwork yes <laughs> i think that our speculative leviathan is a fish yeah i that's where i'm leaning i like the idea of a fish for a couple reasons one because we haven't done a lot of fish talk nope. uh in spooky also because the idea of just a real big fish mm -hmm. is pretty cool yeah well and i like going with fish for a couple reasons, because though it's been interpreted as a whale in more more recent lexicon and media, and though there have been interpretations that went a more reptilian route, there are a couple of descriptions that call it a fish. Right. Or give it very fish-like traits, you know, saying gills, fins... Uh, one of them did say fish. Uh, I can't remember which one it was. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it, we have a range that we could go with, but there's only one that has been like called out specifically a few times. Right. Well, that also gets us gills. It gives mm -hmm. us fins. It gives us scales. It also g gives us uh, uh, some of the other, you know, you mentioned horns yep. and teeth. And while it's not impossible to get, you know, a whale or, or mammal or, or reptile yeah. with stuff like that. In my mind, I can think of fish that have spines and, mm -hmm. and structures like that. And when you said teeth, like prominent teeth, the first thing that came to my mind was like a viper fish. Yeah, right. With just those demon teeth. Yep. Filling the mouth. And then the other thing that sticks in my brain that I can't get out of my brain is the fact that according to at least one of the stories, the Leviathan is the male. Yep. Which makes me wonder, because we've talked before about uh, sexual differences in our spooky creatures and, and those behavioral differences that come of that. And we've also discussed how a lot of the time, especially for things like fish uh, and, and insects and stuff, that females are the large ones. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, you have space for carrying eggs, things yep. like that. Which then made me think... Are there examples of animals where the male is just preposterously larger? Yeah. Because we have like anglerfish where it's the opposite, yep. where the, the male is super tiny. And we even mentioned that uh, uh, potentially for our Kraken yep. episode. And the first thing that came to my mind was elephant seals. Yeah, that's a good one. Where you have a harem, right, uh, as it's called, where the male is huge and is in charge of a group of females oh, yeah. the reason the male's big is to fend off other males exactly and then i thought well that also fits with the mighty and powerful if these are animals that are aggressively defending a territory mm -hmm. and the ones you come across are these big males yeah who are going around being territorial basically being a danger Yes. If you get too close. Yeah, testosterone overflowing and just aggression toward anything that they can be aggressive toward. I, yeah, no, that's a, a neat idea. We do have some wiggle room there because I remember there was one description that didn't specify male and female leviathans, but that the leviathan was female and as a was a counterpart to the male behemoth. Oh, interesting. I think there was a bit more commonality with there being the two leviathans yeah uh, i don't know how common it is that like the male's the survivor i don't know if that was just that one story gotcha so that there's even a little bit of flip-flop there yeah uh but i do like the idea of territorial <laughs> the, the big bro leviathans <laughs> well that also kind of goes in nicely hand in hand with the idea of horns and teeth yeah that 
it's not that you are, you know, a lot of monsters in, in movies and mythology and such are ornamented because they're supposed to be scary. Yes. Well, horns and teeth are good for real life being scary and, and fending things off. So you could have a highly ornamented fish. There are fish today that will have physical contests. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that will bite at each other or will headbutt each other as part of defending uh, their territory. Yeah. There are even fish that will become like that. Yeah, I was about to say, we do have the option for m- mating season stuff again, which we, we have used before yep. a couple of times. But there is that option for like uh, salmon take on a more a much more monstery looking shape like they go from being a fish to this hook mouthed humpbacked yeah you know sharp toothed creature so the males can bite at each other and wrestle each other well wasn't there also i think this was in planet earth uh i think there were a type of wrasse mm-hmm. that when they reached a certain age or a certain time they became these big bald-headed yes, males yep, yep, yep. that would headbutt each other and such yeah, no, I remember that too. So you do have, there There are transformations that an animal can go through. Right, F- and fish especially. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of those where they will either transform their physical attributes or become male or female Yeah, that, like at a certain point in life. Actually go, all right, well, I'm a big enough female that I'm just going to become a male now. Yeah. And now I'm in charge of all you smaller females. And that you could even, and I think this is the case with some fish, where that is a way that you make sure that you don't have multiple Mm -hmm. big males going around. Yeah. That in the case of something like our Leviathan fish, it could be that, no, it's a group of, say, females, for example, and then one of them will become the big male, and the presence of that big male prevents anyone else from becoming the big male. Yeah, it, it suppresses any other big male Leviathans. Right, and there are animals in the real world that do that oh yeah well because one of the things that can happen with fish that's a bit different than us land animals is that your body chemistry can directly affect everyone else because you're sharing the same water like the hormones you're releasing can affect the chemistry the biology of the animals around you because you're all swimming in the same juice and so like at the aquarium they added a male cow nose ray to the habitat with the females just to regulate their ovulations oh interesting because his male hormones in the water would balance their body chemistry so like you can have it to where i become a male and then i start releasing hormones that keep anyone else from like physically keeps them it's not just that behaviorally they're not going to likely do it biologically you cannot become a male as long as i'm here so until I die, there can be no other males. Yeah. Which is intense. Fish are intense. They're very intense. But that gives us this really cool biological yeah. operation for how you can end up with a fish where there is, in any given territory, just one of them. Yeah. It's the big male. And they're on patrol. Well, in territorial, they're, they have a whole community to defend. To keep other big males and threats away. Uh, gigantic males and fish also work a bit better than some of your other vertebrates because they spawn. So right. if I have a harem of females, I'm not a big, I'm not giant because I'm carrying eggs. And they don't need to be giant to carry eggs because there's 50 females for this one male. And I'm going to mass fertilize, spawn all of their nests at once. Right. Right. So uh, there's still thousands of eggs. So it, because of the way they mate, being a giant male doesn't actually limit you mating wise. You can still mate and produce tons of babies. Yeah. So yeah, a giant, giant male fish. I do like that. Now, uh, the other note you made about them glowing. Yep. Is another thing that fish do. I made, I saw that in the notes, like when I was going through and they were like, there was one story of it glowing. I went, thank you. <laughs> now, you specifically mentioned the eyes the glowing. eyes glowing. Which made my first thought for that was that it has glowing eye spots. Yes. That the eyes themselves aren't glowing. But you have, like, it probably has little beady eyes. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. some fish do. And then the big 
glowing eye spots. But I don't know if I don't know how common it is for fish to bioluminesce. Mm -hmm. Uh, So usually I I believe in fish bioluminescence is a symbiosis. Yeah, it's bacterial. They have pockets in their body of a symbiotic bacteria. And that's what gives off the glow. Yeah, they can. And many of them can activate the glowing by stimulating the bacteria. So they still have control over how they glow and when they glow. But but they don't glow themselves. Yeah, that's not that's not a very common vertebrate feature. But that's a deep sea thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's something you do in the deep sea. Yes, where producing your own light is much more useful because there is no other light to communicate with. Right. And would also be a handy warning tool, Mm -hmm. you know, especially if you have giant eye spots to make it look like you're bigger than you are. Yep. Of course, in the, which I, although that to be, to be, I was going to say, you know how, why, why would a Leviathan need to look bigger than it is? I was having the same thoughts. But if what you're trying to intimidate are other Leviathan, then okay, maybe. Well, and and we could get a uh, repurposing through ontogeny, like as the animal grows, when it's younger, it has these bright eye spots to try to scare off predators or to, you know, make it look like a bigger prey option than it is. And then as it gets bigger, it's no longer scaring things with that, but now it's a display. Right. I still have the two eye spots, but they, they no longer, they no longer make me look like a bigger fish. They just look my, make my face look bigger and scarier. Right. And it's a way for me to compete with other male leviathan. Yeah. Which is funny because I said maybe it has little beady eyes, but if it's a deep sea fish, then probably not. Yeah. Yep. It probably also has big eyes. Yeah, these are just big <laughs> orbs. Big orbs. I do like that. I also uh, like the bioluminescent for potentially explaining the f- the fire breathing. Oh. If it had a like, I'm because I'm thinking of like the sarcastic fringe head, which has those big mouth, the, the extensions to the jaw that flap open while it's displaying. If there was this open mouth display, uh, like a like a glowing version of what a cotton mouth. Yeah, exactly. Does. If it opened its mouth and then had bioluminescence there, so that it looks like it's getting ready to unleash its breath weapon. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Not only does that fit it fire breathing, but it also fits with what we've been building up to be this very combative, very display heavy, very aggressive that. As soon as your your ship got nearby, it rushes at you with this open mouth. And, like, maybe right, right. it's not actually going to bite your ship, but it's scary. <laughs> it's right. just it's terrifying. Get out of here. Yeah. Interesting. And it could be that it, that there's, um, you know, we've been going with the bioluminescence angle. And the trick with the bioluminescence angle is that if it's deep sea, if it's bioluminescent, it's probably deep sea. But yeah. if it's deep sea... Why is it encountering yeah, a ship? I, I was thinking the same thing, that we are placing it in the wrong habitat. It's a little bit, yeah, it's uh, to be a sea monster. Mm-hmm. So it could be that it's just colorful. It, it could, could be that. Ha- have a big colorful display. I, I could rehash the uh, the ontogeny thing, though. Maybe it's that it lives in the deep sea when it's small. And then as it gets bigger, it moves up the water column and changes environments. You know, so it's, yeah, it's kind of like the fish that spawn in rivers. So it's Mm -hmm. like you can find baby bull shark in rivers, but you don't find like, like way deep into the tributaries, but you don't typically find adults there because once they get too big, they move out to open water. Right, right. So maybe it's something where they use bioluminescent for survival purposes when they're young, but then move out into more open water and just retain the bioluminescence. That's true. Mm -hmm. We could also contend that in our spooky verse, the naturalists writing about this are in submersibles. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the, the Leviathan is a threat for submarines. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the other question, since we're talking about sort of the evolutionary history, I like this idea of having a group where evolution favored this reproductive behavioral style mm-hmm. of one male being uh, in control of a, a of a community group. Yep. That is, here's the territory, here's the family, here's the the sort of elephant seal kind of setup yep uh which could be handy in a sparse competitive environment like the deep sea perhaps and maybe these are big fish to begin with Mm -hmm. and then you've got this 
sexual com- competition, this territorial competition that drives the development of progressively larger males till you have something that is truly colossal. Yep. You know, we haven't l- given a size. I don't know what the s- upper size limit is f- for fish. Like, I know what the biggest fish are. Yep. You know, you've got things like whale sharks. Yep, so that's you our largest fish. Can get a 50, 60 foot fish. And I I guess you, I don't see why you couldn't get a bigger fish. Yeah, well, I, that's, I, I don't know what the biggest fish, like, fossil record wise. I mean, Megalodon, I'm pretty sure, is I, the biggest. I think that is the biggest fish. And so that, yeah, I guess that, that is our, for current understandings, right. upper limit. And then if you assume that a fish can get as big as any other type of mm-hmm. animal then you've got blue whales and some of the big reptiles yep. uh, from the mesozoic which are pushing 80 90 100 feet you know 30 meter animals mm-hmm. which is pretty big you know it, we, we've hit this issue in the last few episodes too because sea, sea monsters are so often just colossally huge when well, it it's similar to when we've had to make our our magic disclaimer when we were dealing with like vampires and mm-hmm. things that actually breathe fire and have, you know, magic blood, there are certain limits. We cannot match the stories one to one because the stories are fantastical. Right. And it, it brings up the question of how big can animals get? Yeah. And that's hard to speculate on because we only have what we have now and we mm-hmm. don't know exactly all the limiting factors there. So there's the question of how big does a fish have to get to match the stories? But then there's also the question of how big does a fish have to get for scared people to call it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> the biggest thing they've ever seen. Yep. Well, and that's <laughs> the Levi- that Leviathan gets bigger and bigger every time they tell that story. Absolutely. Well, and that was something <laughs> else that I, I I thought of when you brought up the issue b- with placing it in the deep ocean for bioluminescence and then it attacking ships is. As I continue to think about it, the stories typically are not of it attacking ships. Right. So we don't need it to be encountering ships very often. Yeah. It can be something that is very rarely, like, my grandfather once saw a Leviathan. Right. And I think I just saw it. And it's like, I'm the second person in my family to ever have witnessed the Leviathan right. and, and I, happened to come to the surface. And I also like the idea that because we talked about it as a, an environmental threat, mm-hmm. you know, this is a danger built into the environment. The, the idea of a giant fish that defends a specific territory ties very nicely into that mythological notion of, okay, don't go to that place. Yes. That's where the Leviathan is. Yep. That's where it dwells. That's if you go there, it's not that, you ha- you're going to have to contend with it. It's not like you have to defeat it to get to the princess or whatever. Nope. If you are passing through here, you might have to survive yep. going past the Leviathan. You, you are raising your chances of death. Another thing that I thought of with the Leviathan when you were talking about the sizes is typically like the biggest animals, especially in the ocean, are filter feeders. Very true. Which I don't see why we couldn't make our Leviathan a filter feeder because we focused it being a display heavy animal. Mm -hmm. It can have teeth, but not be using them to hunt. Absolutely. Like now they're tusks, not teeth. Yep. It can have tusks, but then also other, you know, features for, for actually feeding. Yeah. It's, it's actually feeding with gill rakes, but it has this toothy maw. So that when it displays or when it battles with other leviathans, it can gouge into them. Yeah. Because uh, that's the other thing that I was thinking of with the sizes we were getting to is like Megalodon's big, but it's not blue whale big. No. And if if we're making things that are the size of blue whale, but hunting like a giant shark or a barracuda, you know, or even deep sea fish. Now we start, we have kind of the issue we ran into with sea serpents of what's the environment like to allow them. All right. Well, now are there just like slews of medium sized whales right. for this thing to feed on or something? Like, why is everything so big if it's chasing? But if it's a filter feeder, then it can yeah. fit into a fairly normal earth environment. 
Now, there is the point to be made that most big filter feeders and most big animals in the sea in general are also open ocean creatures. Yes. Uh, And I don't think deep sea is home to a ton of really huge things. Not... Well, so there are a couple that fall into that category. The cephalopods we mentioned. True. Like giant and colossal squid are deep, deep ocean. It's a fair point. Uh, the Greenland shark oh, right. gets to the size of a great white. Yeah. And is a deep sea shark and just very slow energy efficient. And there is the option to have it kind of function on squid. And I know there's a few other fish that function on this rule where it can... Maybe it travels the water column for uh, yeah. feeding. It comes up to the sun-rich waters during the night, you know, where plankton and and krill are abundant, filter feeds, and then goes back down to the depths where it is most comfortable yeah. and where it's actually spawning and reproducing. I was about to suggest, yeah, it's doing a reverse of what sperm whales do. Yeah. It's going up to feed and, which is, I like that idea. Well, and especially if we have it come up at night, because then it means that you're only encountering the Leviathan at night, and then when it glows, it is visible. Yes, exactly. And that was my other thought early on, is like, well, but if it's at the surface, you're not going to see it glowing. It's, it's but the issue no, of, it... like, uh, <laughs> Batman at the beach, or the right. alien in daylight, where it's like, <laughs> oh, you're not scary if I can see it, if I can see everything. Now, the other question, my last question that's in my head, since this is, right, we have the pressures that have given rise to this particular form of fish. And this is a question that I will defer, I think, largely to your <laughs> knowledge of fish. What kind of fish is it? I've been thinking that. So, like... We've mentioned a couple. We've mentioned a few. I feel like we are definitely in... We are definitely a bony fish. Yes. We're not a big shark. We're not... Well, you get the scales and the fins. Yeah. Because, like, sharks have a lot of the... Like, there are bioluminescent sharks... There are giant sharks. There are filter feeding sharks. There are deep sea sharks. But the, a few things that sharks are lacking that I think are important for this is one, there are ornamented sharks, but not nearly to the degree of bony fish. Right. Like if bony we want fish are s- spines and horns. And yeah, stuff. they're just crazy. And there's. Not been, I've never been able to find research on territorial sharks. Oh, good point. They don't seem to hold territories the same way as they don't fight. No. uh, Well, they don't make like nests or, you know, homes in in the coral or the rocks. True, true. Uh, Because that's that's something that has been actively debunked because that was what led to the idea of the rogue shark which gave rise to things like Jaws, right. is that they stake a territory. Well, not really. There's no evidence that sharks do that. So we've got to go bony fish. Yeah. Probably building on something that already exhibits mm-hmm. that sort of territoriality, like a ras. Ras. Uh, I, think I, think, I think I'm thinking of ras. Yeah. Uh, no, ras, the, the I'm pretty fish. sure it was ras. Jawfish are the ones that make burrows and like jaw, like mouth fight and joust with each other. Okay. And mm-hmm. like, are extremely territorial. They make these, they dig out burrows with their their jaws and then will attack anything that comes too close and they will try to steal each other's burrows and stuff. Nice. And, I, and I'm sure there's like a huge list of others that I am not yeah, thinking of. Same. I know I had, I said viper fish early on and that's still the thought in my brain. That's still very, well, that's, that's, that's very much the inspiration for a lot of it. Right. Well, and they also have that serpentine, mm-hmm. which is another thing that I think is fun about a fish and, and a bony fish. A, a lot of bony fish have this aspect is that they can be very long and s- sinuous. Absolutely. Right? Like, swimming with these long tails and fins looking very snake-like or eel-like, yeah. which contributes to that draconic or serpentine Absolutely. Uh, well, relation. And, uh, I like that with the Leviathan, if if we're having the sightings happen at night and it has these big eye spots and this big glowing mouth, that that might be all you see. So it looks like the face is way bigger than it is, C- especially because like True. the mouth could still be massive because it's a fish. Right. And it's like, yeah, the math, <laughs> the ma- my mouth is half my length because I'm a fish and that's how we do. So you could have this massive face when really that is the eyes are halfway back on the body and the mouth is wide but not actually as big so I, it looks bigger and if you do gl- glimpse of the body it looks more serpentine or it looks 
Yeah. It's a slightly different shape. Uh, I do like that. I like the idea that it is a big animal whose display features make it look even bigger than yep. it actually is, which gives rise to these people going, oh my goodness, it must have been a mile long. Yeah, if they're going like, no, no, I know fish. If the eyes are here and the <laughs> mouth is here, we're looking at a 500 foot fit. Like, right. That that's how proportions work. Don't right. tell me my job. And you're you're compounding the dis the, the its actual size, mm-hmm. its display features, and the classic fisherman's yes, story yes. of yep. It, and not you know fisherman, but also a person telling a story yeah. where they were scared of something. A scared human. <laughs> yeah, it it's you're adding you know fifty feet with every aspect that we're piling onto this story. But specifically, which fish? I I I I don't know for sure, but I I do like both the ras the jawfish. I like just because they have the mouth display. Mm-hmm. The sarcastic fringe head I think is is a similar group. They're, I think they're in the blinnies, which are very similar ish fish to the jawfish. I think that this is one of those circumstances. I I'm sure there are people listening right now who are like, no, this fish. They're like, no, 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 this this fish. You, you're forgetting this you're, this cool. You're fish. describing this fish. <laughs> this fish. Yeah, this is like when I forgot that Kalugos existed. Yep, yep. <laughs> Back in the um, harpies. Yeah, I think that was the harpy. Yeah, harpies. yeah, I spent half the episode describing Kalugos and yep. forgetting that Kalugos exist. Yep. Yeah, exactly. no, we're describing a type of fish. In which case, I absolutely put out to people listening tell us what fish we're not oh thinking yes of. absolutely and in fact if you so uh, uh in previous years we've gotten some really awesome fan art of people depicting these our, our spooky creations it's literally the best thing ever it's so much fun so if anyone's out there you know planning to do that or thinking about doing artwork of something Pick whatever fish you want. Oh, like, yes. Pick the fish you think is the best one and bring it along this trajectory. Well, yeah, a lot of times when we do these, it's very rare, at least in my case, I can't speak to your brain, though I probably could. It's very rare that I have like, and here is the very clear specific image. No, half the time someone will send us fan art and we go, oh, that's what it looks oh, like. Oh, cool. Now <laughs> we know what it looks like. That's very convenient. Thank you. Yeah, yep. we have the idea... Uh, but I, I, I can't. I, I have not fully put it together. I have a number of features in my brain. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of so, how I feel with this. And in honesty, with ray finned bony fish, there's so much convergent evolution that I don't. It, I feel like we can kind of do what we did with the fish people, and kind of do what we did with the the cephalopods. Of this is a lineage of bony fish, right? With these features. Whether or not it falls nicely into a modern group, I don't know. But, you know, like, there's multiple bioluminescent groups. Yeah. And, like, even when it comes to the, the I'm displaying with my mouth open, there were at least three different fish that did that at the aquarium. They were all very different groups. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so we have evolved a type of fish where the males get real big and territorial. Yep. A, a type of big fish to begin with. Where the males are have got big fins, possibly long bodies, spines or horns, big teeth that they're using like tusks, and then these glowing display features. Yeah, big eye spots and like a, a glowing features around or in the mouth. Yeah, to to give the impression these are fish whose job is to protect the territory and the, the community back home. And they do so by making themselves look gigantic and terrifying. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, they've got horns and tusks to fight off the other males when they need to. Well, and it's so nice going the route for male competition because then the species is driving itself to these extremes. Right. Well, and, and I think that that's also a very convenient... We talk so much in a lot of our stuff, in our silver screen science things a lot about monsterification and and about adding on traits that are just there to be scary or Mm -hmm. just there to to, to be for fighting uh, like a movie monster. And the reality is that competitive within your own species competition and, and combat and display is one of the areas in real life where you 
actually do have that kind of thing happening. Absolutely. You these animals actually are being selected for their big size, their features, their strength for being scary. Mhm. And so it's a, it's a nice evolutionary trajectory to sort of p- piggyback on to create something monstrous. Well, and it's it's uh you know, that that you get these examples where it's like, there's no reason for an elephant seal to be as big as it is, except because other elephant seals are that big. Right. And and I like that. And this came up in the Sea Serpents episode, because mm-hmm. there's always that question that comes up when we're thinking about stuff like this is, okay, well, defense is an easy excuse for why you're big, why you're, yes. you, you're you have weaponry. But then the question is, oh, well, but the, who, who what are you, you defending right, from? If you're a, the size of a blue whale, yeah. what are you defending from? Oh, it's uh, it's the question that they ask in one of the, the alien comics where scientists discovers their acid blood and go, what in the world are you defending against right. that you need highly acidic blood? It's kind of that where it's, you have this ridiculous defense and you're the size of a truck. Right. And then the easy answer is, well, there's more than one of you. Yep. Yeah, there's a whole species, so yeah, you got to defend against yourselves. Well, it's the research that came out with croc armor, where, you know, croc armor has always been pointed to as like, it's just real good defense. And, you know, baby crocs are indeed eaten by tons of things as they're growing up. Oh, yeah. But then when they research looked into the evolution of the osteoderms, it looked like it's actually potentially more likely that it was evolved to defend against other crocs right. well, as you fought and wrestled with each other. It reminds me of, I saw a poster at SVP one year that I think Lee Hall was presenting about a specimen of Dunkleosteus, the <laughs> great white sized fish whose face was covered in armor mm-hmm. that had damage to its armor. Yes. Like something had bitten and damaged its armor and all signs pointed to, yeah, it was another Dunkleosteus. Yep. Because, yeah, that's what you have to watch out for. So, no, I, I think it's a it's a night. Oh, well, and especially as cliche as the idea is of the big testosterone-fueled strong male animal, there is precedent in some cases for that. Absolutely. And it is an, an opportunity for evolution to kind of go a little bit nuts with creating a creature that is threat built to be a threat <laughs> i mean there are videos of angry male elephant seals fighting cars yeah that that wandered into town saw a parked car and went you you on my beach and yep. just started body <laughs> slamming this sedan yep how dare you look at some of the female elephant seals yeah. that way how dare you be there <laughs> and it's it like yeah it is a bit of a cliche but it happens and yeah like hormonal males is a legitimate evolution strategy so i think i i this is a fun one i wasn't sure where what this one was gonna look like oh absolutely well we got a we got a comment from one of our listeners making the note that lots of sea monsters are just big versions of animals Mm -hmm. which i absolutely thought of when we were putting this list together yep big Um, octopus big snake yep and fish it's like we gotta do something weird and it's been surprisingly easy because the ocean's so weird to be creative with them. Yeah. And yeah, I'm particularly happy with this Leviathan. I wasn't expecting it to be so fun. Same. Well, I, I hope that everyone listening had a good time. We are three down. Three down, one left to go. One last uh, Saturday in the month. Uh, and as has kind of become our tradition... Save the weirdest one for last. Yeah, we, we left the, we- the kind of weird one at the end. So I'll be interested to see how it goes. If you're enjoying this, always let us know. Yes. Uh, we mentioned art. If you're out there, we're not asking for it. We're asking yeah, for it. Please, please, I love it so much. Do it. I have a bulletin board that I put it up on. No pressure at all, of course. We're not asking. Uh, specific- we're not paying people for it. So like, but but if you do art, like if you are inspired and you do something artistic uh, uh, built off of this, tag us, send it to us. We will share it. Uh, we will retweet the heck out of it. We will share it. We'd love that because we are not nearly artistically yes. inclined enough. <laughs> so, you know, if you are if you have responses, if you're sitting there and you know what fish it should be, feel free to tell us. If, if after this, people just start sending us links to pictures of cool fish. Yeah. That would be an incredible side effect of this episode. Absolutely. 
And with that, I think we can wrap up Leviathan. And we'll see you all in a week. One more to go. Uh, And the next one, I believe, releases on Halloween. See you all then. Happy Halloween, everybody. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.